Mm -hmm. Hello, this is Don Hall, and once again, I'm up in Marin Coyle Kilns in beautiful Murphy's, California, with my best bud, Pamela Coyle, the owner and operator of Coyle Kilns. And up here, she makes uh, objects in many different ways, more than just potter's wheels. She's lots of different interesting techniques to create pottery. Why don't you explain a little bit, Pamela? Sure. So this will be our 69th year in business, and my parents moved to this location to become production potters. They realized in time that they needed to have other techniques to do some different works. So they invested in making plaster molds for both Jigger and Jolly. They also made plaster molds for slip casting. So we've always done a combination of those three things, plus some hand building, slab work, extruded pieces, and so on. So today, what we'd like to talk to you about is just slip casting in general. Yeah, and there is a Jigger and Jolly video that we made in the past. Oh, yeah. It's still up, and you can watch that one as well. Yeah. Okay, so just for fun, there's a variety of different works here. So here's a couple of slab pieces with the texture. These are slip cast in a mold as this one was at one point. You can, with a slip cast piece, you can pull a spout, add a handle, this piece is two slip cast pieces that I just joined together. So I had this form from one mold and this from another. So you can take anything that's damp like this, score and slip it and add all sorts of stuff to it, sprig onto it, whatever you want. Here's another bottle form that we made this form in the 50s. These are also slip cast pieces. I carved the outside just to make it more fun. This one was a commercial mold, but I just thought it was neat. And so I, I ruffled the edge while it was still damp. Same with this. This is a mold that I also ruffled the edges on. And these were coffee cups that we made the molds in the 60s, I think. And then I just carved them to make them more interesting. Also, I have pieces on this table that are jiggered. And so we have jiggered, or I should say jolly bowls here, and wheel thrown pieces. So you, you can do all sorts of things and you can mix and match them. I can absolutely, my slip cast clay has the same shrinkage as my stoneware. So I can use one with the other and meld them together. Um, so uh, Dawn was asking me about slip casting, which is something that uh, we've done forever. So what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the clays that we use for casting in a plaster mold are different than the clays that we use for potting on a potter's wheel or hand building. There's actually a different chemistry to the clay and it, and we there's a reason for using uh, this slip casting materials. You can purchase a 50 pound bag of pre-made casting slip as a dry powder. You add water, you add your defloculant. It makes life simple. I also use it for my on-go bases too. The reason we use a casting body rather than, than regular uh, uh, potter's clay made, it, made watery is because the plaster mold that you'll be work pouring into has to absorb the water. So the, the, the casting body, uh, we actually make up uh, with all these dry materials and water and we make it up so thick that it's unpourable. And then we use a product which is called a defloculant um, to make it act like a liquid. So it's also known as a surfacent. Um, but what it is, is it's what we're using is two different salts. We're using sodium silicate and sodium carbonate in a that we make into a solution. And then we put a small amount into our very thick slip and it will then create a negative particle charge on the molecules of the clay and they will push apart from each other and they will act like a liquid. So my liquid casting slip actually has less water in it than a bag of potter's clay. And let me show you that. This casting body, this is just my dry casting mix and I made it thick as you can see. So I'm going to try using some Darvon 7 which is a commercially made defloculant and drop it in and see if it, I can show you how it liquefies. Let me get some in here. If I was doing this in my own, for myself, I'd be measuring this carefully. And now I've added a drop in, and now I'm gonna start stirring it. And you'll be able to see that it will start acting more of a liquid 
look how much more liquid it is right now with the addition of that the flocculant. So when we're making a casting slip, we want to try to have it be consistent all the time. So that if you're casting the same mold multiple times, that the, the, the slip will act the same each time. So one, here I had the a bucket with slip and I added Darvon 7, which is a deflocculant. This is a commercially made one. I make my own myself from sodium silicate and sodium carbonate or soda ash. Once you make up your slip and you've deflocculated it, the ideal way to find out if your slip is the right consistency time after time is to use something to measure the wateriness of it. A viscometer could be a Dixie cup with a hole. These are two different varieties, but the point of it is to be able to make a liquid consistent. So you will use these for glazes, for slips, for other things. So I would dip it into my liquid, pull it up and then time it till the viscometer is empty. So if it takes 35 seconds to pour through and you like the way it looks, that's then you make sure that every time you make your clay or your glaze, that it works through a viscometer the same way. So I made up casting slip that I'm gonna be using. I'm making mine, mine is a little thicker than that example I just made. And you can see that it's coming through a little slower, but this is about the thickness I'd like it to be. And we all use that technique of putting your finger in and seeing how thick it is for a slip and, and glazes, but it's really better if you're a little bit more consistent. Molds for potters are made out of a heavy, um, I should say a stronger plaster than what you get at the hardware store called potter's plaster. And molds are made generally by making a master or an original, making a mold of the mold and then making molds from the working molds from there. So it's a little bit of a complicated system, but it doesn't have to be. You can actually uh, do this quite simply if you're just doing a one-off sort of a thing. So I have molds that are molds that are, that are single piece. This is a single mold that I just filled to the top. This is likewise just a one piece mold. Then I have molds that are two pieces that I have strapped together. And I will strap them together tightly and then pour them. This is a mold for a mug that is three pieces. And so they all fit so that the foot ring is a separate piece inside the mold. So I filled each one of each of the molds already, uh, and uh, the mold is sucking up the water from the slip. So right now I'm going to pour slip into the ease molds. Each mold has a spare on the top, and you go all the way up to the top, and just stop. You don't want it to pour over. Do the same thing with this mold. Same with this mold. And now this last one. So that's used most of my bucket of slip. Now, each one of these molds will start shrinking down and as the water is absorbed into the mold. And you'll be able to see the level of your clay slip start to drop. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna top off each mold to keep the level the same through our casting process. So I kept topping off the molds and I can then watch the thickness of the piece develop. And now I'm going to take the mold which has developed a thickened skin and I'm going to dump out the rest of the slip from the inside of the mold. Let it drain for a few minutes, a few seconds. And then you can see that I have a hollow, which is quite wet. Um, and I will set this upside down and let it continue to drain uh, until it's actually removable from the mold. So that's the last of mine out of there. I'm gonna set this down. I use a little board to keep it from sitting flat on the table so that it's at an angle and it can, can uh, flow out easily. There it is. And then I have one more, which is an open mold. I'm going to dump it. 
So I find that um, when I'm doing this, I need several buckets that are good and sturdy. I need at least one, but preferably two screens. Okay, I'm gonna set this so it can just drain. And I am gonna transfer my casting body from my big tank to my buckets, screen it each time. So you can see I have, I have two screens here, but, um, and a paintbrush because I'm gonna be able to take this slip that hasn't passed through yet and brush it back into the bucket. And then any particles that I don't want in it, like little bits of plaster, will be caught in the screen and I'll just put it to wash. So once I poured the molds, and I mentioned that the mold is going to start absorbing water and it's going to be shrinking down, you can see on these molds, especially this one, that it's really dropped the, the, the layer of liquid in the mold. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to pour more slip in right back to where the original top line was, but no further. You have to be a little bit careful. I sort of, I call it dolloping for no good reason, but I'm gonna bring this right back up. And then if I'm consistent and always bring it up to the same level, I'll just be able to tilt this and check the thickness of the pot. Um, so it, that way I can be real consistent. So at this point, once I poured this mold out, there's nothing to do except to wait. Um, it's got to set up until it loses its liquidness and its glossiness. Then I will be able to trim the spare with a tool and, uh, and then it'll shrink and dry uh, sufficiently in the mold to be able to remove it from the mold while it's still damp. So we took about a 20 minute break after we poured the excess slip back into the bucket. And now I can look at my mold and I can see that the slip is starting to pull away from the mold. So you can see this little separation that's going on. And so with the different, I'll show you how to trim the different molds. So I'm using a wire tool, which is quite rounded, not a ribbon tool, not a trimming tool, but this won't scratch my molds. So I'm gonna put my mold down on a turntable and I'm going to put my wire tool down and bring it along and spring off then the scrap. And I can dry this and reuse it. It's clean, it doesn't have any plaster bits in it. If it did, I would discard it. I'm gonna set that on a clean piece of cloth here and I'm gonna do, this is a little bit wetter than I might like, but it's okay. Clean scrap. More clean scrap. Now, I'll leave this piece sit in the mold after I get it trimmed this spare, and then it will start to dry and separate, and I'll be able to dump it out of the mold. Uh, it depends on the weather. Uh, this is all of my molds are damp from the winter. Uh, come midsummer, this is a much quicker process. Okay, so this is all I need to do on this mold at the moment. I'll, I'll clean up the mold a little bit more later. Let me just do another one. I'm gonna take this pillow pot mold and it has a flat gallery. So I'm just gonna bring it go all the way around, pull up my reusable scrap, do a little more cleanup on it. of the piece and you can choose if you want it to be thinner you can if, if this is a little thicker than I'd like for just a vase so I'll probably carve it which is make a silk purse out of a sow's ear it's easy enough to carve a piece if it's too heavy okay so I took the strap off of this two-piece mold I'm gonna lift the parts and here I have my piece which I can lift out See how easily it's separated? This is gonna be a little vase. I can flatten the bottom on it. Now I could pull a spout. I could add a handle. I can cut it. I can carve it. I have lots of options. So that's a two-piece mold. And then this is a three-piece mold. So I'm opening my strap. And I'm going to just gently lift the 
pieces apart. There's a little, this is an old mold. We made these molds in the 50s. Um, so there's some cleanup that I would need to do. Now this has got a third piece down here that I can lift out. Well, hopefully I can lift out. There we go. My mug. And uh, you can see I've got edges that I'll have to clean up and work on. Now this piece, the spare is cut with a, with a fettling knife by turning it on a wheel. Next step on all this is, I normally wait till this is a little bit drier, but I'm going to use a fettling knife and just take away any of the casting marks. And so you clean up your handle and you can still sponge this when it's dry and really make sure that it's nice and clean for you. So if you're going to plan to make molds or use molds, you have to realize that there's a substantial amount of shrinkage. So I'm going to have Don show you a, a before and after. Um, so uh, uh, he really, it's surprising how much shrinkage you're going to get.